Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Singapore Holloway versus the Korean Zombie. I'm back from a week off. My mom's sick, long story, but uh, uh, had to go back. Thanks to Pat for filling in. We got the gang back together. We got producer Megan on the six. Cody Saftik is on the line. How'd your week go last week, Cody? I didn't pay too close of attention. Wow, man, what a week. Okay, so, so, <laughs> last Two weeks ago, real good times, right? Vincente Luque caps off what ends up being three top tickets, like top ticket, second ticket, third ticket, pretty good. Francis Marshall, kind of the only real apple pie shitter, shitter in the mix. But overall, I think everyone was pretty happy with it, right? Then contender series, I get a little cheeky. Should have hedged it out, but I had goddamn main event, three to one favorite, let it ride, no good. Main thing is, Pat and I shoot the show on Tuesday, right? So we shot it a day early on the Tuesday. All's good on the Tuesday. Now on the Wednesday, like Wednesday morning, I try to get on my Twitter, and right off the get-go, it just, like, hits me with this notification. They can't see anything. just hits me with this notification. It's like, your password is considered too weak, and is no one's compromised it, but you're at risk of possibly being compromised. Had this Twitter account for, like, 11 years. No one's guessed it yet, right? compromised so long story short they're like you need to change your password or we're not going to let you access twitter x whatever you want to call it right so i'm like okay sweet i'll just change the password so i click on it and it's like in order to change your password we're going to send you a verification email to this email now i won't say the email because then people could just be free to try to guess my password on twitter but the email i don't have the email dude it's like i lost contact with that email 11 months ago it was a work email they discontinued it the whole thing shut down. The email itself doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There's no way for me to access it. It doesn't exist. So Twitter's like, hey, man, you want to change change your password in order to access your account? We'll send you a verification email to the email that you signed up with. I'm like, it doesn't exist. They're like, oh, it doesn't exist. Okay, why don't you tell us your problem and we'll reply to the email that's associated to this account. I'm like, it doesn't exist, dog. It's just... It's like it's a bot. At first, I was pro Elon Musk. I was hoping he was going to win. Now I'm hoping Zuckerberg beats his ass. What a pain in the ass. So that's on Wednesday. And that was like the entirety of it. So I texted you my plays. And I some guys hit me up on Facebook. I, I shot them the parlays. And then it was going seven of eight going into the main event with Aljamain Sterling. So it was a colossal night with the easy hedge out. <laughs> but I didn't take it. So I'm just an idiot. I think I was ballsy from the Luke one last week, which I didn't let the I I, I let it ride. Did it worked out? It was a close fight though. In hindsight, the hedge is always safe. And then this weekend would have been like a colossal weekend, and I just let it ride because I was feeling too good, Paul. So four solid lines are the tickets. Just des- decimated by Aljamain Sterling, and I'm still locked out on my Twitter account. So I don't really care. Like, what do I use Twitter for? I put in my plays. I, like I just don't have time to to hit up all the comments and all that stuff. So like I just feel like there's been a disconnect between me and my Twitter. But on one hand, yeah, I mean I put my plays up there. It's not my identity, but it's like something I do and I'm known for, and I'd like to continue doing it. Second of all, though, dude, my DOP racing guys. That's my racing family. That's that's my fight family. Really, there's like 46 of us in there, and those are the people that I do care about that I do want to hit up. And one of our own guys, Tyler Gates from Dogger Pass Racing. Got took a fight. I mean, he's fought a few times, but this was like a meaningful fight for him. Changed camps, went to Factory X Muay Thai, put in the work, reinvented himself, came out, kicked ass, first round knockout, and like, I can't even interact with the guy. Now, here's a silly thing. If you were to DM me right now, the notification would pop up on my phone. I could see half of it. I just can't click open. The second I click open, it's like, change your password. Could get compromised. So like, they didn't pay the bill on some server. And they're just like, maybe they're trying to get rid of bot accounts and mine's just falling into this gray area of people who are too stupid to sign up for an email they'd have for life. What's life, dude? What's life? You sign up for something 12 years ago, bites in the ass. So I'm fired up. I'm fired up. We'll rifle through these picks and I'm fired up because of it. And I'm fired up because I blew an easy hedge out last week and I'm like preaching the hedge out and I didn't take my own advice. So uh, yeah, I think you're question was like how did i do last week and i gave you a super long-winded answer but that's that's how i was doing last week Paul. i forgot i forgot what the question was to be perfectly honest at this point but uh yeah elon give your head a shake 
get Cody his Twitter account back. Like, you don't even look like a bot because you don't tweet nearly enough to be a bot. So, yeah, something something's I I wrong. I hardly follow anybody. So it was like, how is bots? It's just they have ten thousand followers and they're following ten thousand people, right? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know. But anyways, it's not like it's totally lost. Like I am trying to work on it. Like I got a zillion things I'm also trying to do in my life. But I had sent them like an email uh, from my new email being like, this is my username. This is my old password. This is the email that's associated with it. And here's my problem. Thing is, I'd sent two of them. The first one, I was really fired up. And the second one, I came to my <laughs> senses and I was a lot nicer about it. Right. So I was like, blocked, if it was me, if it was me. Let's say it again. They probably blocked you. They're no, no, like, no. This guy no, coming didn't. in with fury on us. Like, what would you write? I would love to see that, like, that email. Can you read that email to us? Well, right it was now? basically along the lines of, like, you wanted me to change this, right? It, because it might get compromised. And yet you're the one that's compromised me. You're the one that's making this an issue. I didn't do any of this. This was not my own doing. I, I didn't post something crazy. I didn't get spammed by somebody and accidentally signed up for something to give a prince in Nigeria, a bunch of money, and now he has my password. None of that happened. It's Twitter. Twitter got me. My own people bit me in the ass. And I might have said, I hope Zuckerberg beats Elon Musk's ass. I didn't say that last part. But I sent it, then I came to my senses an hour later when I was chill. Chill. And then I was like, oof, if it was me and I got that email, I'd be like, pfft. Megan, write the time, go down. Fuck this dude, write me that shit. <laughs> so, so then I sent a nice email where I was like, oh man, you know, this is the deal, blah, blah, blah. And so they responded to the first one with just like, here are the steps that you need to do. So I fill all the steps out. And then like the next day they hit me up and I'm like, oh sweet. And I open it up and it's like, here's the steps that you need to do. So I think they were replying, they replied to the first one and then they replied to the second one because it's all just bots, it's all bots. Give me a phone number. Twitter does not have a phone number. There's no like human being that I can talk to would easily be like, I'll send him a picture of my driver's license. I don't care. I think you're supposed to do that to get verified. So that some people do to sign up for a gambling account wasn't back when I did. But nowadays, I think some of them require you driver's license or passport or some type of pieces of identification saying that's you. Uh, but dude, I'm old as hell, man. I'm 32. <laughs> I have been signed up on this stuff for time. It wasn't like that before. You were You could get pirated. It was your own mistake. You got hacked on your ass. Now they're trying to help mm -hmm. me. And all they did is create a massive pain in the ass. So what do we got here? It was 13 fights, 13 fights in Singapore. And we've had a bunch of tech issues, not Twitter issues, but tech issues that have delayed the start of the show. So we'll just jump into it, yep. have a time, get through. Yeah, my microphone's a little bit uh, a little bit wonky compared to other times uh, we're having. Uh, we, we did perfectly good shows on Monday. And then one little setting was changed, long story short. Now we're not really able to record how we usually do, but uh, hopefully it's not getting in the way. You may not even notice. You probably won't even notice. We got the main event, uh, or sorry, this episode of the Dogger Pass Podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass Podcast are brought to you by Prize Fix. Use promo code DOP when making a new account to get a match up to $100 on your first deposit. Max Holloway takes on Chan Sung Jung in the main event. Max Holloway, eight, minus 800 favorite. Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie, can be had plus 550. I mean, he's an 800, minus 800 favorite. The volume is on point. The only real path to victory here, I mean, Max Holloway, super, super, super durable. Um, the real only path to victory is like maybe Chan Sung Jung can wrestle him a little bit, but like, I mean, the writing feels like it's on the wall. Max Holloway wins, maybe gets a late finish. Like, it, it's one of those things. It's like, you know me, I'm not really going to be doing too much with minus 800s. I imagine Max Holloway will be at the top of your parlays. It's an easy hedge out at the end if Chan Sung Jung's able to implement a certain type of game plan where he, you know, kind of makes it an ugly fight. If he hangs out at range, it's like he's going to really struggle to keep up with the volume that Max Holloway does. On prize picks, they haven't even put up, like, uh, they haven't put up any takedown totals this week, which is kind of weird. Maybe they'll do that uh, a little bit later in the week after the PFL on Wednesday night. Um, but, yeah, Max Holloway, 93.5 significant strikes. If this gets into the fourth round, I feel pretty confident that, He'll eclipse like 100 significant strikes. Don't mind that on prize picks. And then a Holloway, I'm not sure which type of prop to go with. I may drop a little sprinkle on like the late props, like rounds rounds four and five. But uh, that's how I see the main event. What about you? 
Yeah, actually, this is a tough card to pick simply because there's like three colossal favorites on the card. Not big favorites, there's three colossal favorites on the card. And then a bunch of live dogs. So it's like, who do you put at the top with Max Holloway? But straight up last week, like I, I honestly did think Aljamain Sterling was pretty close to a, not a lock. Nothing's a lock, but I wasn't buying into the hype. Everybody was t t talking me out of it. I didn't quite buy into it. If Holloway's my last go, I'm stupid enough to let this thing ride again. This is a fight he wins all day long, Paul. How does he How does he lose? Puncher's chance, puncher's chance. But this is a Max Holloway we're talking about, a guy with legendary durability. And all the writing's on the wall for Korean Zombie. Fan favorite, perennial fan favorite, guy that's gone to the highest levels, competed for a, a world championship, had a lot of fun fights. And, and again, he's like one of the most well-known and well-loved fighters of uh, the last decade plus. But yeah, writing's on the wall for him for sure. And the UFC says, okay, well, you know what? We'll, we'll offer you a reasonable fight. But apparently this is his retirement fight. So he's going to headline in Singapore. He fights once a year. If you look at it, he had one fight in 2020, one in 2021, one in 2022. This is his only fight in 2023. He averages one fight a year. He's at the end of the line. He says, listen, I want a retirement fight. Okay, you can he headline in Singapore versus his easy opponent. His coaches, his manager, people around him, they're like, Let's take an easy opponent. Your whole career, you've just made a whole career of fighting the best guys and having thrilling wars. Like, why not take an easier one? And he's like, no, I want to fight Max Holloway because I'm a big Max Holloway fan. If this is the way I go out, I hope it's against Max Holloway. So it's almost like Way of the Samurai, you know, where they, oh, man, what's that thing called? They stab themselves with a samurai sword, twist it, ah, go out that way. Uh, that's basically what he's doing here. He's going out for one last hoorah. I want to have an exciting fight. Don't care if I win or lose. I want to have an exciting fight for the fans. I'll remember it because he's been a perennial entertainer. He's a fan favorite for a reason. So he's done himself absolutely zero favors. And Max, for the record, I think Max is slowing down. He's only 31, but no doubt the amount of trauma that he's had over the course of his career, he's not quite the same Max Holloway from a couple of years ago. You look at his first fight with Volkanovsky, close. Second fight with Volkanovsky, a lot of people thought he won. Third, third fight with Alexander Volkanovsky, he's not the same guy. His fight with with uh, Pantera, he, he, another fight where it's just like he's taken a whole lot of damage. Now, the current champion of the UFC, sure, but he's supposed to be the number two guy, right? You're supposed to be the second best guy. And I really thought that Yair Rodriguez put a lot of damage on him, really beat him up, kind of looked slow. Won the fight. His, fight with, his last fight with Arnold Allen, again, he shows that he can beat. All of the other guys in the division, just not Volkanovski. He is the second best guy, but he's looking a little more vulnerable holding out that second place. So at some point, someone's going to get to him, but it's going to be one of these young lions. It's not going to be Korean zombies. So expect him to go out, do what he does, but the volume definitely plays towards Holloway. The speed plays towards Holloway. And I, I honestly think Holloway will fight closer to a minus 400 favorite because he'll Maybe take it easy in some spots and maybe give him some too much respect in some spots and maybe choose to throw the game plan out the window in order to pursue this fight of the night type performance against Korean Zombie. But even if he just minds his P's and Q's a little bit and makes a few mistakes, he still wins this fight. So minus 800, what, what can you do with it? Even as a parlay piece, it's not adding much till you get three or four guys on the card. And I'm going to use him at the top. It's just like, who does he go with is the main thing. How does he win this fight? Yeah, logic would probably dictate decision. Zombie took a beating by Volkanovski before Volkanovski stopped him. But what happens with these writing on the walls type guys is like you get finished and then it becomes a little bit quicker and it becomes a little bit faster. And can he sit in front of Max Holloway and eat 300 punches like so many other guys did? Maybe. Or maybe Max just folds him over in a round or two. So I don't know that I love the decision prop. I don't know that I love an inside the distance or a KO or anything like that. But mm -hmm. what you said with prize picks is 93 and a half. That makes a lot of sense. Max probably beats him for four or five rounds and racks up over 100. That makes the most sense. But again, last fight, legendary career, 36 years old, tons of injuries. I wouldn't be surprised if his shoulder popped out again and he, and he said no moss. Like, there's just a lot that could go wrong for, for the, those kind of plays. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's super tricky. And even like the uh, the round four and five props are like not that generous. They're best on market is like eight to one and 10 to one respectively for rounds four and five for round uh, Holloway, for, for, for Max Holloway. So like, ugh. not like, you know, when you're, you got to sweat a lot in the first three rounds, if he's landing a hundred significant strikes to get to the money rounds. Um, and any of those types of props, you're always at the will of who's refing that day. 
Like even even going back to like Sterling, it's like <clears throat> some people say it's just sour grapes, and like no doubt that he was super super hurt. But it's like if you watch like Jeremiah Wells versus Semmelsberger, and then you watch the finish of O'Malley versus Sterling, it's just like how is this like the same sport? You know what I mean? Sometimes I, I, a ref will just absolutely let guys go out on their shield, which I, in a title fight, I like to see, you know, give them a few extra shots type of thing. Like he was still kind of moving. He was still trying to defend himself. No doubt he was getting 10 aided in that round. No doubt he was getting hurt. Three, four seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds down the line. Maybe he's completely out, but um, that's just the nature of the beast. There's a lot of volatility, a lot of variance that goes into uh, betting, especially like, you know, like some of these longer props. So it is what it is. Oh, it's talking variants. We got Ryan Superman span taking on uh, Anthony Lionheart Smith, the rematch that nobody really asked for. Um, Ryan span, a minus one thirty favorite. Anthony Smith can be had for plus one ten. I mean, we broke the, down this fight a long time ago. Obviously they fought span gets what a first round submission win. This uh, rear naked choke win. That's kind of the span is going to be super dangerous for like the first five minutes for seven and a half minutes of this fight. And then Anthony Smith, historically pretty durable guy able to stay in the fight. It's one of those things that's like, if you want to bet Smith, you're probably going to get a better price than the plus plus one ten pre flop. If you want to bet Ryan span, Minus 130 seems pretty good, but don't be surprised if he isn't able to get uh, Anthony Smith out of there and completely flames out. Tricky fight. Tricky fight all the way around. I'll pick Span because he already won. Seems to have a bit of a grappling edge early, but uh, don't feel great about it. The under one and a half is minus 180, which I feel like seems pretty accurate. Uh, Anthony Smith needs to probably extend him a little bit. But yeah, this this fight's gonna be fireworks, lots of fun, but not one that I have too much interest in betting with my money. Uh, what's your take here, bud? Yeah, so just quick correction: Anthony Smith beat Ryan Span. He subbed Ryan Span in like three minutes, dropped him twice, two my clean bad. knockdowns. Yeah, and it's it, it's Anthony Smith's last win. So similar to us when we talk about Korean Zombie, it's like oh they're done, they're not what they used to be. Yeah, Anthony Smith's falling in the exact same category. He's not done. He ain't what he used to be. The, the problem is, is that you're comparing them in fights against the best guys in the world. So similar to Korean Zombie, he's losing to the best guys in the world. Max Holloway's fighting the best guys in the world. There might be a degree of, of, of separation and slowing down, but they can still compete against non-contenders. Anthony Smith's last two losses are to Johnny Walker and to Magomed Ankalaev. Two guys that are going to challenge for a title, who's the, I guess one kind of technically did, but top five guys, top echelon guys. He can no longer beat those guys but he still might be serviceable as a gatekeeper and what i kind of don't mind about this fight is anthony smith's a broadcaster for the ufc well liked by the ufc and i almost feel like this is a fight that he likes. is the last guy he beat right <laughs> nobody asked for this rematch quite frankly not happening and yet they're putting it back together so smith beat him clean with the striking last time and then finished the deal with the submission he's got a better grappling than ryan span his striking again span kind of has some okay striking it's one guy's explosive, like you said, for five minutes. Ryan Spence is a one-round fighter. Outside of that one round, whenever he faces adversity, he crumples up. And Smith, Smith's actually got some solid talent. Factory X Muay Thai, Thai guy. Nasty jab on him. But he's got one wheel. He's got a busted leg. He's way slow now. That jab's good. But he's got 50 pro fights. So it's like, how much does he really want to engage with guys and get countered over the top? So... Yeah, again, I do see him slowing down, but I think in this fight with Ryan Spann, one, he already beat him, and now you're rolling back a rematch where he's plus money. He's plus money on a guy who he dropped twice, knocked down, gets on top of, and subs with a rear naked choke, and he's plus money. So that in itself, I'm probably going to roll with that. But beyond that, again, I think it's 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 Anthony Smith saying this is a fight that I want. It's the UFC saying, how can we help you? Two-fight losing streak, but we really like you. You're on our broadcast. What can we do to help you? I think it's a good fight for him. Now, now, why is Span the favorite? If he lost last time, like, why is he the favorite? Well, flip side, Span's now won his last two fights. So you got Smith, who has not won a fight since, has gone 0-2. Ryan Span has won two in a row over Ian Kudalaba and Dominic Reyes. So those look good. Those look really then good. He then he lost to Krylov, though. 
And I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot for saying that Smith. Yeah, Smith won the won the previous fight. I was reading the topology and reading it wrong. Clearly, no, no, it's Um, it's 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 all good. It's all good. The main thing is is that you he's lost two since then, and you got Span wins two, then draws one to Krylov. Let's start with those two wins real quick, okay? So the Kudalaba fight, it's a first round guillotine choke. Just like not much adversity. Kudalaba lands a couple quick takedowns. Span gets back up. He grabs the neck. Kudalaba taps. That's the end of it. Then he gets Dominic Reyes, who's who's done, right? He's done. I'm not going to say he's slowing down or not what he used to be. He appears to be done. He is just not, he's like Chris Weidman, you know? Not the same guy at all. Main thing is, it's a quick knockout. Quick knockout. That's how Span likes it. It's when you give it back to him, there's some adversity. He don't like it. And then that mm-hmm. Krylov fight, a triangle choke? A triangle choke? From Nikita Krylov? Dude, Anthony Smith's a much better grappler. And so if he ends up on top, if he ends up on the bottom, if he can get his takedowns going, great. If he can't, he can still rely on the fact that he can land, hurt this man, and put him down that way. Multiple passive victory, already a win over him, plus money. Yeah, of, of course. Twist my arms some more, why don't you? I'll, uh, I'll be a fool. I'll take some Lionheart Anthony Smith. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopping back over. I'm hopping over to your side, uh, Anthony Smith. Just survive a little bit of the early on slot, which he has historically shown he's able to do. It's a good matchup for him. And I'm an idiot for reading topology incorrect because I remember watching that fight. Uh, moving on down, we've got Giga Chikats taking on Alex Caceres. Giga Chikats is a minus 250 favorite. Caceres can be had for plus 210. Who you got? Okay, so at first I'm thinking plus 210 Bruce Leroy. I like it. I like it. I like it because, again, when you're looking at a moderate size favorite and plus 210 is a pretty good size for me, like a, a very solid number, what's the path to victory? And in Bruce Leroy's case, the grappling, 100% the grappling. He's a BJJ black belt. He's competed against other BJJ black belts in both competition jiu-jitsu and inside the UFC. He's got a nasty back take. And again, good rear naked choke, solid fundamentals, wrestling, Never been great, not very physical, especially at the weight class. Uh, he gets out muscled in a lot of spots, but he's very technical. And because he's become a gatekeeper with 30 plus pro fights, is that he'll use that technique to just put himself in good spots and he'll win a lot of very solid grappling exchanges. Now, his striking has also developed a lot. And now he's one of the coaches at MMA Lab in Arizona, putting his coaching hat on, has tightened everything together. Bruce Leroy has found second life. He's on a little bit of a run right now. And why could he not bank on that grappling advantage to swing a fight over Giga Chikots, who hasn't fought in 16 months, and to anybody's knowledge, has no ground game, right? Not known for his ground game. Here's a glory kickboxer. Here's a Kukish and Karate black belt. Here's a human highlight reel striking machine who's not known for his grappling at all. So I have a clear path to victory. And it's plus 210, like, in on that. But I think I'm going to cower out. I think I'm going to cower out because, again, you look at the tape and his, the wrestling may have gotten better. He has a knack for finding good positions, but if he can't consistently take down these better strikers, he gets chopped up. And, and he, he kind of thinks he's a decent striker, and he's a decent striker, but he's willing to fight anybody. He's got a great chin. He's willing to throw down with anybody, and that's to his detriment. So you look at his last loss because it's kind of the most telling of how we think this one will go, but that Sodic so Yusuf fight, he can't take Sodic Yusuf down. So now he needs to stand with him, which he's just not really equipped to do. Now it's fairly low volume. He outstrikes him 66 to 64. He goes one for three on his takedowns. He just can't make anything meaningful happen out of it. And for the most people's opinions, it's a 30-27 Yosef. If you're a Bruce Leroy fan, you may have scored it 29-28. But his punches don't have as much zap. They're not quite as eye-catching for the judges. And the volume's not super high. So against these actually good strikers... He's going to struggle. Now, Julian Arosa is super chinny, right? Daniel Pineda gave him one hell of a go. Well, with the grappling early, I suppose. But at the same time, more of a wrestler grappler. Sung Woo Choi, we'll talk about him later. Just not very good all around. Kevin Cruz is a badass bare knuckle boxer now. Holy shit. But as far as an MMA fight, not really all that good at the UFC level. So yeah, standing in front of Giga Chikots is no doubt the best guy he's fought. This guy beat the crap out of Edson Barbosa in a stand-up battle. He took out Cub Swanson with a giga kick like a minute and three seconds into their fight. Like even though Calvin Cater put a, you know, I would say the pretty decent beating on Giga. Look at the numbers on that fight. 144 to 128. Giga lands 128 significant strikes against Calvin Cater, you know, a top, you know, top five, probably top seven guy of the division. 
all good stuff. He's an elite level striker. So Bruce Leroy can take him down. He is going to get beat up standing. That's the bottom line. And that's kind of how I see this one playing out. So super tempted, super tempted by that underdog money. And I think it's very juicy. But there's a couple other underdogs later on in the card. I got Anthony Smith. He's one. We'll take on a few later on. I don't know if I'm going to get to that Bruce Leroy line. So the official pick and the official play is going to be Giga Chikot. But the 16-month layoff, the grappling disadvantage, the injuries, he's getting a little bit older now. Yet none of that bodes confidence. So even though he's a bigger favorite, not going to be on the top ticket anyway. I would hate to put him on the second ticket, but... Again, we'll see how things play out when the time comes, but uh, I, I, confidence a little bit lower than it than it probably needs to be at that price. All right, yeah, no total agreement. Not don't really have anything to add to that one. Let's move on to the next fight. We've got Rinya Nakamura taking on Fernando Garcia. Rinya is a minus eight hundred favorite. Garcia can be had for plus five fifty. This is what's changed the most, Cody, since like we kind of first started here. It's just like elite prospects, Rinya Nakamura tremendous like absolute stud great wrestling pedigree seems incredibly athletic seems like one of the best prospects to come out of japan in quite some time to be perfectly honest perhaps he's the chosen one but he's priced as the chosen one minus 800 in his second ufc fight habib took like i remember i've talked about this a million times i always bring it back to Habib, but it's like it took him Taking on what short notice? Uh, who is the jabroni that had to Daryl Horcher? In? Horcher. It, it took him like that. It took him like eight fights and a late notice replacement in Horcher for him to reprice that. The books have sharpened up. They know that it's like certain elite prospects come in, they're gonna absolutely roll. I mean, we're in Singapore. We're over, we're over in Asia. Um, a lot of Asian fighters, and this may be the best prospect, at, particularly definitely at uh, bantamweight division that uh, the Japan's released in quite some time. He's gonna absolutely smash. But how did I? I got caught in the in the trap last time out where I was just like, this guy's submission game. Even though he was taking on, uh, uh, he was taking on Kazama. I'm like his his submission game is so elite that he's going to be able to like submit anybody. And then he just goes out there and just absolutely knocks him out. So it's like, it's really tricky. Try Like I think his inside the distance prop is super, super short as it should be. I think he probably gets the submission here. Uh, I don't know what the price is on that. That's probably, I'll, I'll go back to the well and then he'll come out and just like land a hammer and, and and get yeah him by submission is like plus two seventy five which I don't mind he's fighting a Mexican Cody so you know about you know how their chins hold up, um, Rinya is going to win him by sub at two seventy five one book has plus five ten that's not gonna last so that's probably where my money will go uh, what's your take here. Yeah, so the UFC one, they're in Singapore, which is their Southeast market. So their South uh, Asian market. And they're very hot on the South Asian market. They want to have guys that are not necessarily from Singapore, but if a guy's from Singapore, great. More likely, these guys from Japan, right? And they're going to try to push them to the best of their ability because a star over there will be quite profitable. Now, a star in Mexico is also a hot demographic for them, but they got Alexa Grasso. They got Pantera. They had Brendan Moreno. They've had champions. The market's developed there. Mexico is, is a hot market. They want that same thing from Southeast Asia. So they're going to try to pursue uh, the best guys out there and give them the best chances to go out and win. And that's the exact same thing you're getting from Rinya Nakamura. As you mentioned, this guy in himself is a young prospect, the solid wrestling pedigree, solid in terms of, you know, Japanese accolades. But I think he was also a champion at the under 23 worlds, which is a big feat considering he was a pretty solid underdog going into the tournament. The guy can wrestle. Not only that, his dad, Kozo Nakamura, one of the founders from Shudo. So he understands grappling. He understands wrestling with the purpose of striking, the intent of striking. He understands all this. And from the age of four, he's basically been developed into the super soldier. So a lot of times you see these Japanese fighters struggle with wrestling in particular. A lot of strength, physicality, wrestling. Kind of been the downfall of the Japanese fighter over the last 10 years. Yeah, Nakamura doesn't appear to be that. He's very physical, he's very strong, his wrestling is elite, and his striking is very solid. So he, again, you see that in his last fight, where he goes out and gets that 33-second knockout, but you see in some of his other fights, he's a bit of a brute, comes forward, and he's just so physically strong, 
he can batter you. I think he's got a lot of confidence in his wrestling so that allows him to open up with his boxing and, and let his hands go. And similar to a Bo Nickel, right? There was a time where they were just, just wrestlers. But there's no just anything anymore. Everybody can do it all. And those guys that are really good athletes, um, they're going to be able to transition a lot quicker. Bo Nickel, to my knowledge, only started striking in the last, you know, let's say five or six years. This kid's been striking his entire life. So his wrestling is obviously his bed and brother, or his, his bread and butter. But I think he's got a plan B and a plan C. He's got other options and other tools. Now, why is it important that they bring in Fernie Garcia? Well, Fernie Garcia represents one of the lower level guys that they've got on the roster. He won a fight on the contender series versus Joshua Weems, who went on to have one fight in the UFC, lost, and they cut. He has one fight in the UFC and they cut him. You almost never see that. But that's kind of where Fernie's at. Fun fight, but big holes in his takedown defense. And of course, now he's 0-2 in the UFC. Lost to Journey Newsom. Bad look, but again, his grappling is what fails him. He gives up the two takedowns, he gets control, he loses a unanimous decision. And then Brady Heinstein, who is a wrestler, Brady takes him down three times, doesn't really do anything with it, didn't look great for the record. But the takedowns are there. With Rinya Nakamura, the takedowns are going to be there all day, all night. But the striking is probably also good enough to get the job done. But I think at some point, he just strikes for a little bit, strikes for a little bit. If he can take Fernie Garcia out, great. If Fernie Garcia is your typical Mexican and he can take one hell of a punch, which is entirely possible, both losses in the UFC, both decisions, then I think he mixes in some wrestling here and there to secure rounds and win the decision. So huge favorite, absolutely huge favorite. And at least Max Holloway is a proven commodity, and this kid is not a proven commodity, right? So do you want to pay that kind of number? And I can't parlay them both together on the top ticket because it's still not getting anything. Um yeah, I don't know. But, dude, he walks. He walks. It's a setup fight. The UFC knows what they're doing. They're giving someone that poses a little bit of risk, and they're getting his feet wet so they can build up on this kid. And it's not just like, believe the hype, believe the hype. He's got some skills to back it up. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to play contrarian on this one. No. All right, we got Aaron Blanchfield taking on Tyler Santos. Blanchfield is a minus 140 favorite. Santos can be had for plus 120. Who you got? So Blanchfield seems to be everybody's baby, right? I mean, she looked impressive pretty much her entire career. She's been fighting grown women since she was like 16 or 17 years old. And she has like a lot of notable experience and notable wins prior to even coming to the UFC. So even though she's super young and Aaron Blanchfield is still very, very young, and you would consider her to still be in that like developmental stage of her career at 24, it's like she's already got all the skills she needs. Her grappling seems to be world-class for this division and for the level of competition. It's world-class against them. You have a solid knack for taking the back, very solid top pressure. Wrestling, my opinion, work in progress. I don't think it's all that clean, but again, she's able to muscle down a lot of her opponents, brings that forward pressure. Striking had previously been lacking, but you saw in her last fight with Jessica and Draw, she battered her pillar to post standing before taking her down and getting the easy money submission. So there's a lot to like from Blanchfield. Again, making improvements was already good to begin with. And not even close to her prime. So very good stuff. Very good stuff. Thing is, it's not like Taylor Santos is exactly a, a washover. Like she's only 30 years old herself. Her run in the UFC was basically flawless. She won four fights. I would say lackluster level of competition, but Molly McCann, kind of somebody people know. And you and I joke around, she's got a loss to Mara Barella, and you don't let friends bet on people that lost to Mara Barella. But since then, what's the knock on her? You know, wins over Molly McCann, Jillian Robertson, and Roxanne Modafferi. All three of those fights were either 30-27s or 30-26. Uh, Joanne Wood subs her in the first round. Beat, you know, again, very solid performance. And then her fight with Valentina Shevchenko. It's a very good fight. Split decision. I scored it for Shevchenko 3-2. Some people scored Taylor Santos 3-2. Both situations, she's 3-2 against what was supposed to be the GOAT at 125. She took her down twice. She held her own in a lot of striking spots. I just thought she lost the decision. It was a close fight. It was a good fight. It was actually writing on the wall for don't bet Shevchenko at high money prices, which I also didn't take because I better over Alexa Grosso. So stupid. Main thing is, Taylor Santos made the champ look vulnerable. So there's a lot of skills there. And now she's a sizable enough. Let me just look at the price again. Sizable enough underdog. Nah, maybe not. This is not that bad of a price. I guess when you think about it, like Blanchfield in my it's mind tough, is the right? favorite, right? I just don't want to pay a whole lot for it. And you can have it at minus 145 in some spots, 150, 140 range. That's really not that bad. 
Again, the pick for me is Blanchfield because I'm Blanchfield believer. Even though his striking looked good or last time out, it's like Jessica Andrade kind of has not been looking very great all that much recently. So uh, you kind of got to bite the bullet a little bit and have faith. She's 24, but I think her cardio is better than Taylor Santos's. I think the wrestling, she's going to have some problems early initially, but because her cardio is, is an advantage over Santos, she can push the pace and be the one that's coming forward, the aggressor cause Taylor Santos to fight off her back foot, she'll tire her. Eventually, the takedown will materialize. If the takedown doesn't materialize, she's just going to have to keep that forward pressure going. Or, you know, Taylor said, if she does, I don't know. There's a lot of scenarios here. But the main scenario is put the foot on the gas, tire her out, push her backwards, take her down if you can. If not, keep the heat on. And I would think Blanchfield does exactly that and squeaks one out. Either it's a close decision win or it's a late submission. But I'll go for Blanchfield too. I think she's the real deal. 24 Solid wins already. I think the best is yet to come. Whereas Taylor Santos, credible, serviceable, a tough learning experience type fight. I just don't think she wins. So Aaron Blanchfield. Yeah, I mean it's two of the uh, you know two of the rising stars in this division taking on each other. Um, she's thirty, but yeah, I hear what no, you're saying. I mean she's but she hasn't been like she's been on the rise. She, I mean, mm-hmm. going to split decision against. Valentina Shevchenko when she was a massive underdog nobody really saw that coming but that could kind of speak to the fact that maybe Valentina is a little bit on the decline right now I haven't really historically been a big time Blanchfield believer but she against against Andrade like I mean, the stats kind of lied to you in that fight. Like, she was kind of... She like, did not get it's struck 53 51 to 53 on the yeah. significant strikes. Oh. But, it's like, watching that fight, I was on Andrade. And, like, from the moment that fight started, I'm like, this is a bad bet. I'm about to lose a bunch of money. Um, I'm kind of surprised looking at the stats there because that's not how that fight really played out. And then once she was able to get the fight, fight to the mat, it was over immediately. A lot of this fight's going to probably come down to, like, who's able to get takedowns, who's able to get top position. And I'm going to side with Blanchfield uh, on that. I think, you know, she, as, as you always like to say, 24, still making lots of improvements. I think we're at Tyler Santos is, you know, the pinnacle of her career right now um, in terms of her development and impressive development going toe to toe with the uh, 125 pound women's uh, champion and GOAT in Valentina Shevchenko. It's a great, great, great fight that, frankly, it could probably have been, like, you know, the main event of, like, a uh, of an Apex card, to be perfectly honest. Uh, moving on down, we got Junior Atafa taking on Parker Porter. Minus 140 for Atafa, plus 120 for Porter. Low-level heavyweights, Cody. Uh, Porker coming off of, like, you know... <laughs> A, a brilliant, a brilliant win for Porker last time out uh, against the probably somebody that literally, like, I mean, it's very rare that you have somebody come into the UFC, get one fight, and then they're like, "Oh my God, we should cut that guy." That what was were a we thinking? Bad idea, and that's exactly what happened with Braxton Smith. Uh, Junior Taffa comes into the op- into the organization. You know, everyone's calling him like Good Taffa, and then gets taken down, controlled, and in a very, very slow, methodical, boring fight against uh, against Bad Usman. Um, I don't know. I have no idea. I guess if if Porker can kind of stick to a wrestling heavy game plan here, I think I like him as a underdog plus one twenty against Tafa because Tafa didn't really show too much uh, ability to stop the takedown. Uh, it was a high volatility fight, but I'll go with the ever so slight dog in Parker Porter here. What about you? Yeah, so I'm kind of thinking the same thing actually. Like I think Parker Porter, if you were get plus money underdog status on him, like yeah, in a middling heavyweight fight, he's quite literally the definition of a middling heavyweight. He's a 38 year old shaped like a bowling ball, you know, gamer of a man. And sometimes he can take a hell of a punch, and sometimes he just folds right over. But that's heavyweight fighting in a nut shell right so i can't really fault him in any one area it's just like he's limited he is what he is but he can cash as a plus money underdog he's done it before i think there's a chance he can go out there and do it again the narrative on this one though is that he's fought junior taffa's older brother justin taffa who is likewise garbage and he got smoked he got smoked he got knocked out in like a minute 
And now he's fighting Junior Tafa, who the UFC is trying to actively get a win for. So I, you know, in, in, in that regard, they're setting it up. I'm just not buying the setup. You know, we talk about other setups, what the UFC would like to happen. The UFC is not setting anything up. These are not fixed fights. There's just of what would be best for business and then what could happen. Best for business is Junior Tafa wins. Again, he's a 26-year-old, nice, accredited, glory kickboxer. He's got a very fan-friendly style. And we want him to go out there and prosper. We gave him Usman thinking it would be a fun fight. It was not. It was a terrible fight. Now we want to give him Parker Porter to try to get him that first win. Parker Porter, meanwhile, shows you how little they thought of him. He lost to Justin Toffa in a minute. It's a really bad look. This is a very, very bad look. Then they book him with Braxton Smith. Because even they were like, oh, Braxton Smith might not be UFC quality. But let's just see. Give him Parker Porter. Like that, that, that was the level that he was at. And Braxton Smith swung on him and just, you know, he happened to beat the, the shittier guy. So, yeah, this, this fight doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence. But to me, on a personal level, part of the reason he got caught by Justin Toff is Justin Toff is a six-foot Samoan heavyweight. So he's very short and compact. And then Parker Porter, because he himself is a very short man, he needs to get under. He wasn't able to get under that center of gravity. He ate the counter and he got knocked out. Junior Toff is a better kickboxer. But he's a longer kickboxer. He's a rangier kickboxer. He likes to use that six foot three frame of his and every bit of his reach. That's why he was a better kickboxer. But in terms of MMA, it doesn't translate as well because these big burly guys can get under, they get their underhooks, they'll press you up against the cage and they'll lean on you because you've been kickboxing your whole life. The grappling's not there. The cardio for the grappling is not there. And you might be able to fight 10 rounds, but you can't grapple five minutes it's, they're different muscles it's different situations and for a guy in parker porter that tips the scale at every bit of 265 pounds weighing him weighing on you and leaning on you it drains you it sucks a lot of energy out of you and i think maybe he doesn't get the takedown early but if he pins him up against the cage early he'll have some some success if you can tire him parker's cardio is not bad like he's losing the early portion of alan bodo which is a bad look by the way takes him down beats him up on the ground Braxton Smith swings on him. As soon as Braxton Smith kind of starts to try to catch his win, he's right on top of him. So, again, Parker does have the cardio advantage. He's got the experience advantage. He's got the wrestling and the grabbing advantage. But it's heavyweight fighting, and he's got to check his chin, man. Do not get clipped early because that'll be his downfall. For Junior, that's what he's trying to do here. Intercept him on the way in. Pull a Sean O'Malley on him. But it's just way easier said than done. So for the plus money, yeah, I'm going to take that small little whiff on Parker Porter to go out there and lean on him and get the job done. Sometimes he likes to swang and bang, have a fun fight. Don't do that. Grapple him. Press him up against the cage. Swang and bang when she's dead dog tired. But don't just run out there like an idiot and club away at him. Play it smart. If he does, I, I think he could win. So ever so reluctantly, I will take that plus money flyer on Parker Port. All right. We got uh, Waldo Cortez Acosta taking on Lukas Breschke. Minus 220 for Cortez Acosta, plus 185 for Um, It's one of, kind of one of those things. It's like both are haven't really shown like proclivity, proclivity to finish. Both of them tend to spend most of their time upright. It's kind of like a heavyweight fight that, you know, probably goes to decision. And both of the guys have shown – an ability to like get well over a hundred significant strikes. The way I'm going to be invested in this is on prize picks from a coach DOP. Uh, there's 61.5 significant strikes on uh, Waldo. I think this, that, that should probably go over pretty easily to be perfectly honest. Like you look at his previous uh, opponents and, you know, spent a lot of time on his back, still got to 82 against uh, Marcos Rogerio de Lima, 147 against uh, against Chase Sherman, 73 against Jared Vanderra. It's like, if I, th if I think that this fight's going to go, you know, 12 and a half minutes or even more, it seems like a pretty, a pretty decent spot, to be perfectly honest. So I like uh, Cortez Acosta to win, but minus 220 doesn't feel great to me. Cortez by decision. And then, yeah, over 61.5 significant strikes for Waldo. Uh, who you got here? Yeah, so first and foremost, the over. The over is the way to attack this one. I don't know what kind of price you're going to be able to get on that currently, but the over two and a half in the fight goes the distance. You got Waldo Cortez Acosta on one side, who is a pro, pro boxer. He does have some decent hands, and he's a fairly long, big guy. 
but he doesn't really show a whole lot of power. He'll throw volume like Paul's saying all day. He'll land well over 100 significant strikes if he can all day. But even with that, he's not toppling over, guys. And Jared Vander, uh, whatever, you know, he's built like an ogre. Doesn't have great durability, but maybe he takes all the shots. Chase Sherman took all of the shots, too. And then even in his last fight, his loss to Marcos Rogério de Lima, pretty much Marcos Rogério de Lima is a one-round fighter. He either beats you in a round or he loses in a round. Not, not a whole lot of guys go to decision with him. But I think that's you're seeing Waldo. Doesn't, where's Waldo? Where's Waldo's power? That's what I want to know. I don't really see it out of him. So for a big heavyweight, more of a volume guy, touch, touch, go. The boxing allows him to have a nice jab. He likes to set up quick little combinations. He's very snappy, but he's not sitting down trying to lay his opponent out for the most part. When you look at Lucas Bershewski, he's in a similar situation. He's had two losses now in the UFC. Both of them were by decision. He looks like a fairly durable guy. In his fight with Martin Budai, there's an argument he got robbed. He outstruck Budai 118 to 66 and lost the fight. And didn't get taken down. So what the hell's going on there, right? And I was on Buddha, and I was very happy to get that greaser out, but like, eh, probably shouldn't have happened. And then against Carl Williams, I bet him. I actually did bet him thinking, you didn't get a fair shake against Buddha. This guy's probably better than maybe people are giving him credit for. And in the first round, he got taken down a bunch, but he made him work. In the second round, he got taken down, and he quit. Not that he quit, but he gassed out hard. And once he gassed out, it was like, I don't want to be here no more. But Carl Williams is not much of a finisher, let alone even a heavyweight to begin with. So like, he still lasted a decision. That was a tale of two fights, man. One fight, he's got cardio for days. He lands volume for days. The other fight, the once wrestling was played into it, he just couldn't keep up. So if I'm Waldo Acosta, Cortez, the path of least resistance is the wrestling. The thing is, he didn't got none. So he's going to have to take the path of most resistance, which is fight this guy for 15 minutes and land well over 100 significant strikes, which is just hard to do. So fight goes the distance in both scenarios. They're both durable, and they both don't got a ton of power. But in terms of the actual pick, I think I picked the underdog shot on Berchowski. You and I talk about all the time about, again, middling low-level heavyweights. And our other middling low-level heavyweight fight, not that much juice on it. This has got a ton of juice. So sure, Berchowski's 0-2 in the UFC. But again, he very well could be 1-1. And and his fight with Carl Williams, he almost certainly lost because of his wrestling. He doesn't have to worry about the wrestling in this fight. And he's, he's a big, strong, lumbering guy that can land significant strikes, maybe lean on him. And I would say... You pursue the takedown. You take this guy down and lean on. Chase Sherman took him down and won the third round. Rogerio de Lima took him down three times, and he had absolutely no answer, no get-up game. Live underdog, dude. Live underdog. He just falls on top of him. He could win a round. If he just catches a kick, he could win a round. And judges are so bad these days. If you know you're going to get a sloppy heavyweight fight, where both guys land over 100 significant strikes, and it goes 15 minutes, subjective judging alone makes this a good price. So yeah, dude, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Not going to be high up on my order of my priorities, but I'll take the underdog here. Rescue decision plus 425. That doesn't sound horrible. Um, yeah. yeah a split you decision? make a lot of good points. You make a lot of good points there. I don't know split decision. I don't yeah, have those books are the that really books. offer The books are all out of that now. stuff. Oh, yeah, some of them have them, but like I don't have it up in front of me. But I bet you it's probably like 14 to 1, 15 to 1, which like wouldn't be a bad look either. Uh, maybe even more. Uh, um, all right, moving on down. We got Garrett Armfield taking on Toshiomi Kazama, minus one, 170 for Armfield, plus 150 for Kazama. Uh, Armfield going from Onama to Kazama. Here's the thing about like some of these. Some of these fights lower on the card where I'm in doubt, I kind of look at it and I go, Asian guy fighting in Asia in his time zone. This card is going to start at 5 o'clock in the morning for us over here. So it's like, how long has Garrett Arnfield been over there? Is his body going to be you know, acclimatized to the jet lag? And for him, it'll be like fighting at like 7 o'clock in the morning. It's just like, you know, I think it's kind of a tough spot for a lot of these guys, unless they're spending tons of time over there. Maybe you'll be able to fill in like where he does a little bunch of his training and stuff. But if he does it stateside, it could be it could be a rough it could be a rough go over there. So I don't mind. Um, I, I think I see like plus 300s out there on Kazama by sub. I'm going to wait for more books to open up. Maybe we can get a little bit better than that, but I'm going to side with uh, Kazama as an underdog against Garrett Ironfield here. What's your take? 
so this one is actually just like super dangerous because both guys have a very risky proposition. Like when you look at Kazama, his jujitsu looks nice, man. Very, very nice, very slick. And unfortunately, jujitsu is not a real fight. It's not it's an element of a real fight. It's a, one of the primary elements of a real fight, but it's not a whole fight, man. And so his jujitsu is dope. He's very slick. He'll get the submissions, but it doesn't appear that his chin's all that good. And so his fight with Shoji Sato, <clears throat> this is in April 2022. Keep this in mind. He's a fight with Shoji Sato, who's two and two. He fails to submit him in the first round. He gets knocked out six seconds into the second round with a flying knee. Ah, shit. I've seen Shinya Aoki do that too. Because they're not actively trying to take you down, like a well-timed takedown, they're just trying to grab a hold of you and rip you to the ground by any means necessary. It's not well set up. And you can time it. And remember seen Hell, remember that idiot? Remember, ah, I shouldn't call him an idiot. He is a good guy. But he's fighting uh, He's fighting the Bosnian bomber. What was that brick wall guy's name? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, I got to bring it up because it's bugging me. Anyways, Demir he Hadzvik. wins the first two rounds like nothing. Demir? Demir Hadzvik. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I got yeah. you. I got you Absolutely back, Absolutely killed I'm me. listening. He got my back. He got my back. So he wins the first two rounds over Demir Hadzik, like nothing. And the third round, it's like, oh, I'm going to roll for an Imanari block. And ball right to flying knee, knocked out. They have a knack for putting themselves in bad spots because they're not natural strikers. So he gets knocked out by a flying knee. And then five weeks later, he took that fight on road to UFC. Five weeks after he got KO'd, he was like, I can't pass off this opportunity. So he gets a journeyman. I can't pronounce the name. I'm not even going to try. Karimuale. <laughs> I'm not even gonna yeah. try. He's 27 Nobody and 11. You to know that. Nah, nah. Even people I know who that you're think they know about. would probably don't. Yeah, so that's people like will be Karim Wally, Malmi. I got you too. I, I, there's so many syllables. What are we supposed to do with that? There's it's just too like many syllables. Six names in one. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. No. Nah. Short enough. We could game. have a competition of people people filming themselves trying to pronounce it or recording themselves trying to pronounce it. It gets something different every time. The main thing is. Yeah. He, he wins the fight. He wins a decision. You know, grappling again. His grappling looks pretty solid. Doesn't get the submission in that one, but maybe he's playing a little bit conservative, uh, conservatively because he knows he's got a fight in the finals of this road to UFC, and he literally just got knocked out five weeks ago. So he jumps right back in against Rinya Nakamura, who we've already talked about and we think is a stud, and then he just gets dropped like instant, straight left, mm-hmm. right on the money. He's out of it from the get go. So it's like I, d- I don't think he's comfortable with the striking. I don't think he can take a punch. And even his jiu-jitsu, which is world-class and quick submissions and very fun to watch, like, he's not even submitting journeyman guys in Southeast Asia, then what are you going to do against, like, an actual bona fide fighter? And in Garrett Armfield's case, it's like it, he appeared to be, they got him listed as uh, Kill Cliff FC, right? So I'm thinking to myself, geez, if he's at Kill Cliff FC, that's going to go a long way for him, man, because he's out there training with some of the best guys actively. He's putting himself in bad situations all the time. He has top-level training partners. People will say, oh, man, he got smoked by David Onama. David Onama is a giant 145-er. He took that fight. Garrett Armfield took that fight on, like, five days' notice, up a weight class. Yeah, they fought as amateurs. They fought as amateurs, like, five years ago, man. They're not in the same weight class anymore. David Onama is a big featherweight. Garrett Armfield is a normal-sized bantamweight. So him just dropping down to 135 will be better for him. He's only 26 years old, so one would have to believe that improvements are still going to come. He's out of a big mega gym with solid training partners. All that bodes well. All that's good for business. The thing is, the only thing that's kind of hindering me from just cramming this minus 175 Garrett Armfield is like, his grappling's not all that good, man. So when he gets taken down, he's getting submitted a lot. He's giving up a lot of bad positions. And again, 26, getting better, training at a world-class facility. They'll have him ready. Natural weight class, he'll be ready. But you made an excellent point at the beginning of the uh, of the fight where it's like he's traveling all the way to Singapore on relatively short notice. Not short notice for the fight, but short notice because they fly you out a week out. You're jet lagged. You're not used to competing at that time in the morning. And you make one momentary lapse in judgment and you've got a far superior grappler on top of you. So it's not going to be a clean win for Garrett Armfield. It's probably not even going to be an easy win for Garrett Armfield. But I... I kind of and leaning him he's the actual mixed martial arts he's got the actual rounded skill set his opponent is a specialist and that just doesn't really work in 2023 he'd be great for bellator they have guys like that on all the time 
And even those guys lose every now and again. But at the UFC level, I'm not so sure. So last point for Armfield is the fight with David Onama is 13 months ago. Okay. So imagine a 25 year old, he's now 26, 13 months of training at Killcliffe FC with some of the best guys surrounding himself with great training partners. He's almost certainly back at his regular weight class. You're going to see a better version of him. So I'm expecting a better version of him. And if, if he is even slightly improved, uh, stops a few takedowns, he wins this fight. And with Kazama's chinny history, you have the knockouts on the table. It's on play, right? Sprawl and brawl this guy. Stop the takedown, clip him, put him away. Way easier said than done. That's the path. All makes sense. All makes sense. But uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be taking the Asian underdogs in Asian in uh, China or in Singapore. Um, and we'll see how, we'll see how it shakes out. I just worry about like the jet lag and all of that. I don't know all the details of like when fighters have gotten there and stuff, but I'm surprised there's like, it's one of those things in that New Zealand fighters, to be honest, because like they'd have a way better, easier, yeah, like way of, yeah, way easier. But there's a pile of American Billy Goff, Chidi and Jaquani, unless they're being dragged out there to get their asses kicked. Parker Porter, like it was quite possible. So you're fading a lot of those guys, uh, not Parker, I suppose, but I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. You're, you're you might be onto something. They have a lot of, uh, well, there's the, there's the pay per view. Uh, Strickland versus Adesanya that's taking place in Australia. Yeah. So a lot of the Australian yeah. guys are already booked, hence why they needed to fill this with a bunch of Americans. That's fair. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's, I mean, it's really not too many spots. Like, in some of these closer fights, so it's like, that's where I'm kind of leaning. Um, when, when, when in doubt, I'm just going with uh, Asian and Asia. We'll see how it shakes out. But we got uh, Lord Michael. Ola Sheshak taking on Chidi Bang, Chidi Chidi Bang Bang, uh, and Jaquani minus 120 for Mikey O Baby and uh, plus 100 for Chidi. Banger fight, absolute banger. Love it. Nobody's going to be bothering wrestling in this. This is just going to be an absolute slug it out war. And frankly, since Mikey O went to um since he went to middleweight it's like i like his frame a lot better there um a lot of the problems that he ran into when he was playing at light heavyweight a lot of, you know bigger guys like jimmy crute Ovin st pru who are like way bigger frames than him we're just taking him down exploiting him kyle Borallo, very very smart in there that's his game plan he you know takes you down and and obviously he's going to be super super exploited in a matchup like that but uh, you know, this is kind of, it's a coin flip fight for a reason. I'm not going to be shocked either way. I expect violence, but I guess I'm ever so slightly leaning to like durability being slightly better on Mikey O's side, maybe a little bit. I mean, the power is probably a, 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 an absolute match between the two of them. Um, I'm just, yeah, for the purpose of this show, the pick is Mikey O. Um, confidence isn't very high, but can't wait to watch this fight. What's your thoughts here? Yeah, dude, I'm completely going to agree. I got old baby Mikey O. Uh, oh, baby. This guy goes out there and gives you a good fight, ah, a fun fight, win or lose. He goes out there, lays it all on the line. But clearly there's a lot of skill there. It's just he fights stupid, reckless fights for the most part. And I think that's kind of been his downfall at 205. You mentioned his loss to Alvin St. Pru. He 10 aided Alvin St. Pru in the first round and then gasses out and has no ground game. At middleweight, his cardio seems to be better. His power was lightning at 205. At 85, it's he's well-equipped to knock out another human being. And again, cardio seems better. Wrestling, nah, it, it's not any better. But now that he's fighting smaller guys, it should theoretically help. Now, K.O. Barahal, that's just a terrible stylistical matchup. And K.O. is actually a gigantic middleweight. So it wasn't like he was really escaping any size in that spot. Lasted to the second round, good enough. But yeah, grappling is always going to be his deficiency. If you will stand and bang with him, he can stand and bang with the vast majority of the division, at least for five minutes. And at middleweight, you almost do get the impression that he could be a little more effective. Now, he's been fighting in the UFC since 2017. He makes his debut at 22 years old, okay? And he's very flawed. And since then, he's had 11 fights in the UFC. Six-year tenure. He's 28 now. He's made a lot of mistakes. He had 
uh, what was his name? Yeah, he, he's had a couple of these spots where it's like he's got these guys done. He lets them off the hook. He gas out. But there's no denying he's got a ton of ton of power. He's just got to tie it all together. He's 28 now. I think improvements are still coming. I still think, you know, he's not green. He's a veteran of the division, but he's still going to continue to add to his toolbox. Can he fight an elite grappler? No. Can he fight an elite wrestler? No. No. Will he ever be able to? Probably not. But this is onto the UFC's part now. They need to match make him with bangers accordingly. That's what this looks like in the Chidi and Jaquani fight. I think Chidi and Jaquani, though, did not want to bang with him. So there was a time where Chidi would have done it. Chidi was an excellent Muay Thai fighter. His brother, Anthony and Jaquani, also an excellent Muay Thai fighter, but UFC veteran, WEC veteran, very high-level striker. Chidi even fought Simon Marcus one time in a controversial draw. Simon should have won. All the same. Fought Simon Marcus. I went to a draw with him in a Muay Thai fight. Guy's got excellent striking. His own problem, similar to, oh, baby, Mikey O., he got no ground game, but Chidi actually put the time in, got a BJJ black belt. From there, you see, he looks way more comfortable in fights. If he gets taken down and, you, and you're not an elite level guy, he can catch you. If you don't take him down because you're worried about the grappling, you have to stand with him. And if you have to stand with him, he's super dangerous. I didn't, never expected him to get to the UFC, but he gets a fight on the contender series. Despite losing three of his last four Bellator fights, the UFC welcomed on the contender series and he beats that Mario Souza, who's not very good. But he smokes him. His ground game looked good in that fight. The Mark andre Barrio fight, 16-second knockout. Looks really good in that fight because it's over before it starts. The Dusko Todorovic fight, he just absolutely mauls him. But now you're seeing the cheaty of old resurface. He's 34 years old. His cardio is not very good. His takedown defense is not very good. And as you win fights, you're now expected to fight better guys. Against those better guys, he comes up short against Gregory Rodriguez, who stood tat for tat with him and looked excellent in the striking, and then eventually gets him to the ground and submits him. And then his fight with Albert Duraev, he got taken down a bunch in that fight, but he gassed out. He gassed out hard. And when it was standing, he's super reluctant to strike at all because he's worried about getting taken down. So I, I honestly think that Mikey O can forward pressure him, just absolutely throw down, clip him with something, and put him away. If he does not put him away, he'll likely gas out. But get this, he's so cheating into Kwani. But if Chidi trips him up and gets on top of him, it's Chidi all day. He's got a much better ground game. He's got a very underrated ground game. Uh, against high-level guys like Gregory Rodriguez and Albert Duraev, maybe they look make him look pedestrian. But again, so Mikey, oh, that ground game could be the path of victory for him. I just don't see his offensive wrestling being good enough to put his jiu-jitsu into play. And I don't see Mikey O going to the ground with him unless it's to hammer his lights out off for a knockdown. So probably you're going to have two guys banging out. One guy's 28 and is beaten... Good 205ers absolutely kicked the crap out of Oban St. Pru in that first round. Go back and watch it. A guy that's capable of knocking out pretty much anybody versus a 34-year-old who's the damage is starting to accrue a little bit. The motivations may be starting to get a little bit sour. Winning three fights has started off great. Now you're on a two-fight losing streak. You got to reel it back a little bit. I just feel like maybe he's vulnerable and uh, a guy like Michael Alexachek can go out there and capitalize. So that's what I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Lord Michael, oh baby Mikey O, whatever you want to call him, that will be the pick. I also got to think this thing ain't not going the distance. Like He's either going to succeed and knock out Chidi in under one and a half, or Chidi is going to take his best shot, give it back to him, and sub him sometime. Probably also under one and a half, but a Chidi win might be like late in the second round, maybe even early in third round, probably late in the second round. So in both scenarios, win or lose, I just don't see this thing going to the scorecards. Yeah, of course. It's I mean, it's minus it's almost minus 300 to get finished inside the distance under two and a half. It's like minus 245. And that's total um, juice too. Yeah, I mean, even the one and a half is like minus 140. So people are expecting violence. It's going to be a hell of a fight um, as long as it lasts. Moving on down, we got Rolando Bedoya taking on Kanan Song. Uh, minus 300 for Bedoya, plus 250 for Song Kanan. Uh, my bad, I got it in reverse orders. Uh, on my I don't sheet think here. there is a right or wrong way. Either or, and you hear it all the time. It's always a production issue, but with like the Chinese names, I always struggle. Because it's like Zhang Wei, uh, Zhang Wei Li, right? Wei um, Li Zhang. Exactly, but like the last name is what they say first. And then the first name is what they say second. It's for like the graphics, you gotta, you know, it's it's a whole it's a whole thing that most people probably don't care about, but I 
I, I always con- <laughs> constantly get kind of tripped up on that stuff. But, uh, I mean, Bedoya, first UFC fight coming in, massive underdog against Chaos Williams. Frankly, I know it was on your PRP, or sorry, I know that Will- Chaos was on the, you know, parlays. I had him on some parlays. I'm sure he was on the PRP. Watching that fight, I thought Bedoya won. He should have won. And uh, it was super, super close. Chaos Williams most definitely did not cover like his minus like 400, minus 300, minus 400 price tag there. Bedoya showed up, showed that he's uh, he's got some definite skills on the feet. Um, and 149 significant strikes. I can understand why he's a favorite here, but it's minus 300 with, you know, it's one of those things that's like, it kind of reminds when I was thinking about it, I was just like, you know, it's it's kind of like, um, who was the guy that O'Malley took to? Chris Montino. Montino. So it's like, yeah. guy shows up, short notice, overperforms, does way better than we kind of expect. And then the follow-up fight, the market is just super inflated. It's just like minus 300 here. It's like, I don't like Song Kanam, but like plus 250, you know, Asian fighter in Asia. I don't know how long Bedoya has been over there. It's, it's all kind of, it's all kind of scary on the minus 300. I thought Bedoya looked great against chaos Williams, but I'm going to really, really struggle to get to that price tag. Let's hear what you have to say. And then I'll make my official pick. So again, much of the same thoughts as you is that Bedoya, very similar to Chris Montino, he comes in the UFC, relatively short notice, takes a fight, is a sizable underdog, gets his ass kicked. Oh, not, I shouldn't say get his ass kicked. Montino got his ass kicked. Bedoya maybe won the fight, dude. I, I, trust me, I had Chaos Williams very high up that week. And maybe that's the bias. I thought Chaos Williams is up too, but I was not happy. I was not comfortable. And when you look at the striking numbers on that fight, First round is 44-44. Second round is 40-39. So it's dead smack down the middle. Thing is, Chaos Williams is a six-fight UFC veteran who's fought good guys. And this Bedoya kid's a 26-year-old Peruvian with no big show experience. And that's how he performed. So stock, stock up, stock up for sure. Who cares that he lost? Thank God he lost because I had a lot of money against him. But his stock definitely shoots up. So did Montino's. Then they book uh, Chris Montino versus Guido Canetti. They book him against Guido Canetti, who's not good. You can't spell Canetti without can. Everybody knows this. But he's like a 41-year-old Argentinian banger. And he just absolutely cold cocks Moutinho and puts him away. Well, what happened to the durable chin? What happened to that like, ability to take everything that Sean O'Malley hit you with? $50,000 fight of the night. Guido melts him on first connection. So you you overestimate a guy he lost and you still overestimate him out of there. But again, the difference is Moutinho did get his ass kicked in that fight. At no point did he win around. He landed a few punches. He took a whole bunch of punches. But at no point did he win any of those rounds. Whereas Bedoya arguably won all of the rounds, arguably definitely won the third. But like, you know, he could have won a 30-27. He could have won a 29-28. He could have lost a 29-28, which isn't what the judges gave him. But Stocks up for this kid, man. Chaos Williams has also got some big power. Like, if you look at all of Chaos Williams' wins, for the most part, uh, early, I guess I should say, now he's a decision guy. But he was just ni- knocking people out. Solid, solid power. But Doya took everything he had. And what you're seeing from these South American guys is they're very physically strong. They're going to come forward. And they're going to get in your face and make it a tough fight. What they lack in potentially, like... Uh, but they lack in like clear technique. They make up for in that willingness, that grittiness, and that strength. And I think another good example is that Robbie Ring kid from the Contender Series last night. He's he's undefeated. Did you watch Contender Series last night? I did. So the kid's undefeated. He's undefeated as an amateur, and he's undefeated as a professional. And they do his little his little thing. He's like, oh, my mom was a black belt under Chuck Norris, and my dad's a combat jiu-jitsu black belt, and I've been born and bred to be a fighter, and all of his amateur fights are for his parents' promotion. His parents are his coaches. His parents, mom and dad, cornered him for the fight. And he's taking on this, this Luis Penejo, okay, who's got one thought on his head, kill, kill, kill. And Robbie looked faster than him. Robbie started landing some hands. Bang, he got hit. When he got hit, it was like, oh, shit, I'm not used to that. And for Luis, it was like, this is a walk in the park. This is what I do in the, on the reg reg. Way stronger, way more physical. Broke right down through the undefeated, good-looking prospect. 
and put it on them. Peru, uh, Peru, very undeveloped market. They've always been strong. It's just there's no real good Peruvian fighters. There's no real good a uh, program. There's no real good gym. But that's changed, man. Like mm -hmm. it's advanced over there, and you're seeing a ton of good Peruvian prospects come over, and they all have the same thing in common. They're super durable, okay, and they're very physically strong. They will take a punch to give a punch, and I just feel like this is good cardio. Very much the same thing. Solid cardio, and again, because and I'm not going to say oh they're dirt poor. They I'm not trying to make anything like that, but because they come from a from a economic system that they are very very motivated to improve their living situation we shall say uh they will fight to the best of their abilities there's no would, i'm hurt from that need of the body it's i need to perform bedoya embodies that song Kanon is not he's not super durable is wrestling like he dropped ian gary and he took him down so that'll be his claim to fame and outside of that, he's fought some good guys in the UFC, but the results aren't there. The layoff definitely did nothing to help him. I don't see a refined skill set. Bedoya just walks right through everything he throws. Uh, throws, and unless the guy's got a non-existent ground game, which I don't, I think he's, I think he can grab a little bit. Unless he's got a non-existent ground game and gets laid and prayed, something I don't see happening. I think he walks. So three fifty, yeah, it's too much for an zero and one guy, but. I mean, that Owen one guy should probably go out here and perform and take care of business. So even though it's in Singapore, they're not trying to do nothing for this Chinese prospect. Bedoya is a tough fight, and yep. I think he goes out there and performs and, and gets the job done. Yeah, and a lot of Chaos Williams fights are, like, usually a little bit more low volume. And Bedoya forced him into, like, a dog fight there. He's just like, well... If you want to keep up in this fight, like we're throwing 150 significant strikes, like we're landing 150 significant strikes. And yeah, just to talk about the cardio for like Peruvian fighters, like most of that country is at like super, super high elevation, um, which I think probably factors in. It's just like if you live at does. like, yeah. if you live at like 5,000 feet uh, above sea level your entire life, it's just like when you come to, you know, you're just going to have better cardio than the average person. Um, it's science. Uh, moving on down, we've got Yusako Kinoshida taking on Billy Goff. Minus 125 for Kinoshida, plus 105 for Goff we got. Okay, so this Yasuka Kinoshida, I think he's a legitimate prospect too, man. This kid just turned 23 like two days ago. So made his debut in the UFC at 22 years old. Looks like he's got a whole lot of power, very strong, very physical. Um, a lot to be left desired with with his striking, but it's a work in progress. He's 22 years old. Like, he's got the physicality. He's got the power. He's just got to bob and weave a little bit, move his feet a little bit, kind of pace himself at times. His only pro loss, before his UFC debut, of course, was a disqualification for grabbing the cage. So Japanese fighters traditionally fight a lot in a ring. Most of them don't even train with a cage. And so you will see oftentimes these Japanese fighters get disqualified for cage grabbing. That's not a real loss. And that's his only loss. So there was a lot to like about him. On the contender series against Jose Henrique Souza, first round, they go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They're, they're striking. Kind of tit for tat. I'd say it was a close round. I scored the fight for Kinoshita, but I could see the argument the other side. Second round, just keeps coming at him. He had previously all first and second round knockouts, but in that fight, second round, cardio checks out. Third round, cardio checks out, and you get the third round knockout. So now I'm starting to believe in him a little bit more, <laughs> but too much. He's still an undeveloped green prospect he's defeated essentially nobody of note he's barely even fought in a cage he got disqualified when he fought in a cage because he's, he's green in that area those are guys you don't bet minus 350 price tags on but i did but i did against adam fugit because fugit why not i don't think he's that good fugit has a little bit of wrestling turns out a little bit of wrestling is a lot of wrestling when you got no wrestling and kina mm -hmm. got taken down he got mauled on paul that was a vicious vicious mauling he almost made it to the end of the first round. He got stopped with like 24 seconds left in it, I think. But he had nowhere to go. He had no answer for it. And that's that's very clearly the hole in his game that is there to be exploited. So this fight six months later, I'm sure he's attempted to fix it to the best of his abilities, but he's going to rely on an opponent that's not going to take him down. Now, Billy Goff actually wrestled in high school, and I think he wrestled just a smidget in college or university, but nothing really of note. And when you see him fight, he's not looking to wrestle. He's looking to bang it out in the pocket. He does not move side to side. He does not cut angles. He's not trying to create a target. He's looking to stand right in front of you and throw it out. That's how he does it. 
He has scored a underdog win himself against Hobson Gracie Jr. This is in Bellator. This is, I guess, three years ago now. But he's a minus. He's a plus four oh five underdog because Billy doesn't got a great ground game. Hobson Gracie's a is a Gracie, and Billy just toughed it out, man. Again, he's one of your rugged blue collar East Coast guys. He's a CES champion over in Massachusetts, and you know what you're going to get out of him. But he wants to stand in front of you and he wants to throw down. His last four wins: first round knockout in minute eleven. First round knockout, four minutes and 34 seconds. Second round knockout, two minutes and 13 seconds. And a first round knockout on the contender series against Shyman uh, Smotrinsky. But Smotrinsky knocked him down early and then pops back up. And then Billy Goff, he's down to scrap, dude. It's a good fight. It's a good fight. Billy ends up turning the tables again in the knockout. But I've seen him wobbled in other fights as well. I don't think his chin's that good. Now, can he overwhelm lesser competition by standing in the pocket and being the tougher guy? Yeah, absolutely. Gary Bellotto Jr., Justin Sumter. Uh, Marty Navis, you beat those guys from being the tougher man. But Yusuke Kanishida, he hit really hard, dude. He got some solid power. I don't know if you want to rush in the pocket and stand and bang with him. And whereas taking him down, that's the way to go. I don't know that Billy's going to do that or that he really has the skills to do that. So I'm going to take Kanishida to get the job done here. I'm with you. I'm with you 100%, bro. All right, moving on down. We got JJ Aldrich taking on Na Liang. Uh, minus 600 for your baby or former baby. We'll find out. Um, Aldrich and plus 420 for Na Liang. Na Liang is it's kind of hilarious. She's like a one minute or she's like a one round fighter. Absolutely comes out there with fury. I can understand why she's a massive, massive underdog. She hasn't really shown us anything to uh, to really kind of show that, like, outside of on the regional scene, gain or a lot of first-round finishes because she's fighting people without any skills. She comes into the UFC, and it's just like, well, this is a totally different ball ballgame. Um, so we're interesting because, it's like, Aldridge doesn't usually get – you know, early finishes. She's more of a tactician. Stays on the outside. She picks you apart. But like, all she has to really do is kind of just survive the early onslaught here from Naliang, who's just going to come out and be crazy. And uh, maybe she gets her first, first like first round finish. Because I mean, Aldrich plus or round one is like plus two twenty five. Don't hate that. If you want to go completely like off the chain. If she could get get it done, would be like Naliang in uh, round one is like plus plus one thousand, but I I can't back Naliang uh, with with my money to be perfectly honest. Not the biggest Aldrich guy, but I think the room that she trains in and all of that, it's like I I just haven't seen anything that would lead me to believe that Naliang is a UFC level fighter. So. Aldrich, though she's not an early finisher, typically it's like this is the stylistic matchup for you to get the job done early because Naliang will come out there, try to finish you in the first couple of minutes, and then fall off the damn cliff. So Nalia, or sorry, Aldrich, obviously clearly the pick, and I think uh, as more markets open, like Aldrich round one is in the plus two hundred, maybe plus two fifty, maybe somebody opens a plus three hundred. Don't hate that as a small shot. What about you? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree. Aldridge is a giant favorite, so at this price, I think Pat Mayo would tell you straight up, "What's the worst that could happen? Take that big plus money." But I, yeah, I'm not gonna get there personally. But it's like, yeah, what, what could possibly go wrong here? And that's JJ Aldridge hasn't looked that good of late. Hundred percent, it's because she fought Lipsky and Blanchfield, who are both on the up and up. But yeah, maybe maybe you're uncertain. And then with Na Liang, if you want to like imagine telling somebody, oh man, I'm an MMA fighter, making I'm I'm making my UFC debut, right? And it's like, oh, you are 19 and four. Is her UFC debut when she debuts? 19 and four. I'd be suspect. I'd be like, how'd you get to 19 and four? No one's heard of you. I'm 19 and four. Of those 19 wins, 18 first round finishes. 18 of 19 wins inside the first round. So you know it's just can crushing, padding. Did the fight happen? Maybe. Was it that person? Maybe not. Not a good look. So we can only judge her from what we see in the UFC, and we've not seen any of that. So Ariana Carnelosi, not a great grappler. She took Carnelosi down three times, couldn't do nothing with it, tired out, and then got TKO'd because she was gassed. <laughs> Fair. 
Let's give her some time. Let's see if she can maybe, you know, work it out. Takes on Silvana Gomez Juarez, fails to take her down, gets knocked out in a minute, 17 seconds into the first round. Okay, not great. What if we were to bump up to 125? As if that's the solution here. So she's moving from 115 now to 125. A weight class that she's not fought in, at least in a very long time. She gets away on being a little more physical and a little more rugged and snatching up these first round arm bars. But like the, the more you're going to move up weight classes, it's not going to materialize. You're not taking on bigger, stronger opposition. You're a one-trick pony, and that trick wasn't working to begin with. Going to be tough. And for the record, Carnalosi and... Silvana Gomez Juarez both don't have a ground game. Whereas like JJ Aldrich, she went the distance with Jillian Robertson and grappled her and beat her. You know, she's fought in a bunch of actually solid grapplers. And yeah, you know, sometimes she does okay for herself and sometimes not so much. But the main thing is, is that she's fought in a zillion times better level of opposition. And then, as you said yourself, the training room, the training room she's in allows her to get solid rounds in and prepare herself for situations like this one. So Nali Yang, like, again, she's going to come forward like a bulldozer. She's going to try to grab a hold of JJ. She's going to try to peel her to the ground. She's going to try something, make something happen for herself. But if that doesn't happen, she will tire. She will gas out. And she's sitting target. JJ's finished most of her fights by decision. But this is an easy, ugh, not easy, nothing's easy. But this is a, a, a good TKO spot for JJ Aldridge. So I think she finishes inside the distance. Yeah, minus 145 for Aldrich inside the distance. That's what's the, the TKO? Safer. I'm not taking the sub. I would take the TKO. TKO is... Yeah, it's probably not going to win by sub. But who knows? Like, Nalian gets so freaking tired that, like, maybe she just That's falls true. into something. Yeah, I know. Uh, like, like the only... Wrong, she, she's oh, only man. had one fight where she's went to decision, um, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, one fight, and that was against that Lilia Shaki Rova, the <sighs> girl that, that Lauren Murphy finished in the second round. And that was three years ago, and that girl never come and back. And that is from no. that, like, war, whatever, Chinese promotion. So, allegedly, allegedly that happened. I, I, right. I, I, didn't, I didn't go back and watch that fight, I'm not going to lie. Um, Aldrich by KO is plus 185. Not, I mean... Compared to minus 145 inside the distance, you may be on something. Maybe that's the better way to go about it. Aldrich, not, not necessarily a finisher, but this is the this but, is the matchup to get a finish. Yeah, what were you but, ask? so Laura, Laura Murphy's a fringe top 10. Vanessa Demopoulos yeah. has got one hell of a chin on her. Courtney Casey's got one hell of a chin on her. Lauren Mueller, I guess, is terrible, but that was three years ago. Yeah, listen, I think because she's got so many decision wins, all of them in the UFC, that it's like there's an idea of maybe she can't strike. But uh, again, when I said low-level wrestling is high-level wrestling versus no-level wrestling, like if if your opponent is curled over and not fighting back from fatigue, the rest is going to stop, okay? They're going to stop. Tisha Torres has a TKO victory. Angela Hill from time to time TKOs somebody. It'll happen. Well, it'll happen. Yeah, it's just one of those things that it's like it's less about J.J. Aldrich's finishing ability and more about the fact that Na Liang hasn't given us any reason to think she can fight 15 minutes, particularly at the pace that she sets. If she sets a really slow pace early, early in the fight, maybe it's like a total you know change in her game plan, which is not out of the realm of possibility. You have to be prepared for that, that maybe she goes like, okay – at this level, I can't come in here and just like barnstorm people like I did on the Chinese regional scene. And then that's where I could see the fight maybe getting dragged to a decision. But um, yeah, uh, Aldrich props, you know, Aldrich by KO. Um, yeah, I don't know if I love the round one nearly as, as much as I was thinking, to be perfectly honest. Probably a lot safer to go about it, uh, you know, over the course of the fight. Because yeah, Aldrich hasn't really shown much finishing ability. And finally, we got uh, Sungwo Choi taking on Jarno Ahrens, minus 155 for Choi, plus 135 for Ahrens, who you got. Sungwo Choi is one of the tougher guys to get a read on because him at his best, he's got some skills. Him at his worst, woof, there's a lot to be desired in, in every aspect. His grappling, his striking defense, his cardio, his chin. A lot of issues. But here's a guy that starts off his UFC career 0-2. Gets smoked by Gavin Tucker. Gets smoked by Mavzar Evlov. He's a total write-off. Then he beats Suma Maktarian, whatever. That's a throwaway. But he beats Yusuf Zalal. Very quality win. And then he knocks out Julian Rosa. Very quality win. 
And now he's back on a three-fight losing streak. Bruce Leroy, Josh Pulabau, Michael Trezano. And I honestly do feel like he's been increasingly looking worse. Like the first one, Bruce Leroy, he wins the first round. He, he does good in the first round. He scores a, you know, a, a clean knockdown over Bruce Leroy, a guy with a great chin. All in the first, wins it. Second round, Bruce Leroy doesn't even take him down. He just pushes him up against the cage, slings onto his back, slings in the body triangle, gets onto the chin, taps him with a rear naked choke. So, yeah, Sung Woo Choi comes from a Korean. It's not Korean Muay Thai. It, it's Muay Thai. It's just Muay Thai that he learned in Korea. He can strike, you know. I think he's like a bronze medalist at like uh, the IFMAs. Uh, it's an amateur Muay Thai tournament. The, the guy definitely can strike. It's just, I don't think he's elite by any stretch. And he doesn't move his head. But he's got a 5'11 frame. I think a 74-inch reach. He can fight long. He's got some decent power. But you see right there that a good wrestler, grappler, can just get right under him. And they're going to submit him. So that's the first knock. The second one is Josh Kulabau. So now Kulabau, well, he doesn't try to wrestle him like Bruce Leroy did. He stands in front of him and he bangs it out with him. And you know what he does? He drops Sung Woo Choi twice. He showed in that fight, his chin's not that good. His durability's not that good. And where there's an excuse, oh, well, I was kicking the shit out of Bruce Leroy before I made a mistake and got out grappled. What's the excuse here? Kulabau beat him clean. And I don't rate Kulabau all that high. But all the same, it's a split decision win. Should have been unanimous. Doesn't matter. The last fight with Michael Trezano, it's much of the same. He has his moments. He lands a few shots here and there. But Trezano just, everything he throws seemingly lands. Like this guy's a defensive liability. He doesn't move his head. He doesn't protect himself. And the more times you get consecutively wrong, you're going to get knocked out. And now the trend's starting on him where maybe his chin's not all that good because Michael Trezano drops him twice, two knockdowns, late in the third round, knocks him out clean, puts him away. So for Sung Woo Choi coming into this fight, well, what does he do good? I, I guess strike kick. He's got a decent push kick. He likes to fire some long shots straight down the middle. But defensively, I don't think he got any better. He doesn't have some wrestling that he's going to be able to dig into and suddenly change the way he fights. He's just going to have to mind his P's and Q's and hopefully he doesn't get clipped. But with his Jarno Aarons, I don't mind him. I don't mind him when you watch the tape on him before he comes to the UFC. Like, he's a Dutch-style kickboxer. And that's way different than that stuff you're learning in Korea, which is high-level striking, don't get me wrong, but there's nothing more high-level than than Dutch Muay Thai straight from the Netherlands. So Jarno Aarons is not an MMA fighter. He's got good striking. He learns a few submissions, but he struggles in his MMA career because he's not just quite, he's not a well-rounded guy, but he's 26. Now he's 26. So he's making some improvements. He's getting better. He jumps into the UFC. I backed him as an underdog against William Gomez because again, I, I, I'm a believer that this kid is progressing and he is getting better. And if I can get him for a good plus money tag, I would be interested in backing him. So I back him versus Gomez. The problem in the Gomez fight is that he's a very hard guy to fight. He's not going to stand in front of you. He is one shot, gone. One shot, gone. He's very quick. He's very fleet footed. And he's super hard to time and get a read on. His fights suck. Because he's just gone. He's here and there. He's gone. It's not exciting. Gone. And so it's a terrible fight. It's an absolutely terrible fight. He does get taken down by Gomez because, again, his wrestling is just not really all that good. Throws up a triangle choke. Fought. You know, tried to mount a third-round comeback. Tried to do his damnedest. It's just it was a bad stylistical matchup for him. This fight with Sungwa Choi, Choi's path of least resistance would be to take down Aaron's. I just don't think he's going to. It's not who he is. It's not how he fights. He's a Muay Thai guy. He wants to throw range kicks. He wants to throw teeths down the middle. He wants to get that jab going. And Aaron's, I think, will come forward. He's got a very good gas tank. He throws in tons of volume. He's going to snap down that low kick and eventually cause him to drop the hands, come up high, nasty hook from the south side, puts him away. So if he wasn't the underdog, I would not be betting him. But the plus money is right to me. I'd be willing to take a flyer on the underdog. So again, there's a bunch of them on this card that have a legitimate chance of coming through. I think we're taking four. Maybe five. I think we're taking four. This is one of them. This is one of them. Yeah, that all makes a lot of sense to me. The biggest problem with Sung Woo Choi is just that the volume's just never really been there. It gets like, you know. Um, the only fight was against Suman Mokhtarian that he even got close to 100 significant yeah. strikes. He had 95 there. And what's the moral of the story there? You never bet a Mokhtarian, Cody. No. Is that what we used to say? Yeah, yeah that, well, that, his, that, his, this, this one was Suman, who was slightly better than Ashcan Mokhtarian. Yeah, and I remember, can. yeah, Trashcan Mokhtarian. I don't know if he got bullied and they said that at school, but if he didn't and they didn't say that, I don't know how you were the first person to think of that because that was gold. And yeah. yeah, dude, neither of them won. There's a reason why they're no longer in the UFC. And Suman's wife, Nadia Kasim, oh my God.
I don't know, where do they find these people? Where do they find these people? But yeah, Sumo Choi can beat those guys. Julian Arosa can't really take a punch. You know, he's 50 50. Either he looks like a million bucks or he's awful. You can beat him. But mm-hmm. Aaron's is gonna he's gonna give him a fight. He's gonna pressure forward. He's gonna land something. And at this point, I think Sumo Choi is just starting to fall behind. I get why he's the favorite. I get it. It's just I would be more interested in the plus money underdog. Yeah, all I was going to say is that uh, other than the Mokhtarian fight there, I mean, he's getting like 46 significant strikes and three-round decisions. It's like if Aaron isn't spending so much time off of his back like he did in the Gomez fight and he kind of got kind of close, he was kind of just taken down, controlled for a little bit. And that's why the fight ended up being like, I mean, one of the one of the judges actually scored that uh, one of the rounds as a 10-10 because he's just like, nothing's happening here. Let's just pretend that, you know, that that didn't even happen, which is kind of hilarious, but which is not how you're supposed to actually use a 10, 10 round, but kind of funny in its own right. But either way, um, yeah, I'm with you. I, I'll, I'll side with the underdog at plus 135 here to, uh, you know, win what I would imagine is going to be a pretty close competitive uh, kickboxing match. Hopefully Aaron's is just able to, you know, throw 60, 70 significant strikes should be able to get the job done. But uh, yeah, that's about it for us this week. Cody hit him with the PRP. Yeah. So again, it's, it's favorite heavy in the term, in the sense that the favorites that we do have are just monster favorites. We've got Max Holloway minus 800 favorite. We're going to take Anthony Smith, dog number one. We're going to go get Giga Chikots, Rinya Nakamura, another huge favorite. Aaron Blanchfield, Parker Porter is dog number two. Rukas Brzezewski is dog number three. We're going to go with Garrett Armfield. Uh, oh, baby, Mikey Yo, Michael Alexic Chuck, Roland Bedoyo, Yasuke Kinoshita, JJ Aldrich, and Yaro Aaron. So four underdogs, 13 fight card. Saw a cool stat the other day. I think it said that dogs were like 34 percent on the whole year so not saying every card's going to be the same but just like as an average you want about 33 percent of your picks to be underdogs so on a 13 fight card i got four underdogs i'm kind of at that number i'm gonna force anything else but if you're one of those big dog players yeah i guess bruce leroy's got that grappling advantage who's our big dog rukas brajewski like should he be that big of an underdog i'm not quite understanding that one but a plus 205 like willing to take a poke there song Kanan, i guess if roland bedoya is super overrated but if roland bedoya is super overrated it's gonna cost me this week because i i'm playing him man i'm playing mm-hmm. him. who's the other big dog like, nali yang if pat put one single dog i don't hate this, i don't hate like, jj uh, eldridge in the first round but i don't hate a nali yang round one play i'm not gonna lie i don't think that's like the like if you're just gonna do that's a little small wins. sprinkle yeah. yeah that's how she's gonna win she's yeah. gonna come out she's gonna overwhelm jj eldridge early in this fight and get a finish like it's not the craziest thing but like she hasn't really given us any reason to have too much faith within her at the ufc level i mean it's a tricky card it's happening in the middle of the morning most people aren't even most sane people obviously we're complete degenerates are going to be sleeping and not watching this um you know in the weird if you live on like the pacific uh like on the pacific uh coast like this is like literally you have to kind of question whether you're going to just stay up all night or you're going to wake up at like what two o'clock in the morning insane if insane. if you're not if you're not a super degenerate then you can just kind of like hit pause in your fight pass and yeah. let the first three fights play and then just catch right back up to real time by seven in the morning let's say and then, and then you're good sense. to go but for parlay rebuilders somebody who might want you know you're gonna for live betters like that's kind of my sharpest market is just betting the fight as it's going on and you kind of have a better idea what's going to happen but yeah outside of that just, just hit pause and it's way more enjoyable to watch a fight when you can skip a minute here and there, when you can skip between rounds, when you don't got to wait five minutes for the judges to scout to tally up. How, how, how does it take that long to count? One guy's got a 10. And, oh, and he got a 10 again. Oh, and then the other guy got the 10. So he's got two 10s and a nine. And the other guy's got two nines and a 10. Shit. Nah, shit. Do you know who won? No, 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 no. Give me another minute. Like, wh- why does it take so long? Why- how does this take so long, Paul? I don't know. Uh, no. My last grievance, and then we can get the hell out of here. My yeah. last grievance is I'm actively trying to get my Twitter account going still. So I missed I missed Contender Series. I missed PFLs on tonight. 
I missed the last UFC. The plan is to get it going for this week's UFC. For whatever reason, I have failed in my mission. You don't see the parlays come out. I failed in my mission. I'll let you know you can put it on the DOP account. But at that point, we need to take the aggressive approach again and Twitter bomb the shit out of the Twitter account bot thing. Just Twitter bomb them. Help CJ Saptic. I can get back on Twitter. Outside of that, thanks for I mean, joining us as always. And my man, Paul Shaughnessy, for accommodating me. Well, worst case scenario, you can just have the dog or pass account and turn it into your personal account. Are you going to have the same number of followers right out of the gate? No, but it'll give you like a 6K head start. Yeah. But then you'd yeah. have to go through and like, you'd have to go through and like yeah. curate your, who you are following again, because I followed everybody for a period of time on that account. Fun yeah, times, but yeah, Elon, if you're listening like... out there, Elon, get, get Cody his, uh, his, his, uh, his account back. I'm, I'm sure you have, you know, bigger fish to fry, like, uh, like fighting Mark Zuckerberg and all of that. But Cody needs, the people need the PRP. All right, Elon, give your head a shake. Um, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Megan and Cody Zaptic, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh.